highlights coming up on the show. Stylish, the Munich-based Rückel company makes elegant gloves. Creative, famous fashion designers make dolls for charity. Valuable, presenting art collector Reinhold Wirth's old master's collection. Euromax highlights, and here's your host, Karen Helmstedt. Hello there and welcome to our Highlights Edition. And we start off with a little primer for the upcoming Christmas season. If you remember the Nutcracker from Tchaikovsky's famous ballet, well here he is and we're heading to his birthplace. The eastern German town of Seifen in the Erzgebirge region in Saxony specializes in traditional handmade wooden ornaments for Christmas and the creator of this upright Nutcracker was a man named Wilhelm Füchner. He began with his production operation back in the late 19th century and six generations later, they're still cracking away. In the beginning, it's just a rough piece of pine wood. But as soon as Volker Füchner puts it into the lathe, he skillfully uses various tools to turn out nutcracker caps. And that's exactly what he enjoys about his work. We were from the stick of wood. The way you can make something from a piece of wood, whether it's a figure or a bowl or a box or something, wood is just simply fascinating. There are so many kinds of wood. Everyone can be worked differently. The painting room is behind the workshop. Here the nutcrackers are assembled and dressed. Everything is done by hand. The Füchner workshop is on the outskirts of the town of Seifen. Here in the heart of the Erzgebirge region, there's a long tradition of working with wood. The toy museum displays arcs of lights, pyramids and other figures from the past 200 years. Including some pieces by Volker Füchner's great-great-grandfather. The professional production of such wooden figures arose out of necessity. For many for some of the craftsmen's families, take carpenters for example, it was necessary to create a new form of employment during the winter, when there was little work. And carving Christmas figures, such as nutcrackers or smoking men, was a useful side job. Which is how the Füchner workshop began. Wilhelm was the first followed by his son Albert, who sold the colorful figures in the local markets as well. Since then, the art of making nutcracker figures has been passed down from generation to generation. But the family has only been able to make a living from them since the 1950s. As kind of we children would play in the workshop almost all the time with the old pieces of wood and shavings. And we'd have our breakfast in the painting room where our mother sat painting. I wouldn't have missed my childhood for the world. Now the next generation works at the lathe. Volker Füchner's nephew, Markus. He wouldn't have considered any other career. I feel honored to be able to carry it on. And when I think that they are displayed in windows somewhere all over the world and that I made them with my own hands, it's a lovely thought. The Fuchners have more than 30 different nutcracker figures in their product range. Their artistic creations are exported as far away as the U.S. and Japan. And given the snow that's been flying here in Germany, it's most definitely time to dig out the gloves. And a quick look around the capital confirms that gloves are out in force, not only to keep warm, but also as a fashion accessory. Well, from short, colorful and sporty to long and elegant, there is a glove to fit every personality. And there's one from every era, as the leading firm Röckel from Munich explains. Austrian Empress Sissi wore them regularly in the 19th century. 
Film diva Greta Garbo made them an important fashion accessory in the 1930s. And so did First Lady Jackie Kennedy. As well as Hollywood star Audrey Hepburn in the 1960s. Today, celebrities also like to underscore their personal style with gloves. For some, it's a fashion statement. For others, just something to keep their hands warm. Annette Ruckel follows developments in glove fashions. These days you can see that all fashion houses sell gloves. They're not your usual hand warmers. They also have stylish ones. It's a big trend. You can't miss it. Gloves are quickly becoming part of the mainstream. And I think gloves are now in. Their popularity will continue to grow. Munich's traditional glove maker Röckel has been making its product for almost 170 years. Ruckel has 22 retail outlets in Germany and exports gloves to more than 30 countries worldwide. Ruckel's products not only warm hands, they're pure fashion. In all shapes and colors, from offbeat to elegant to timeless. Master glove maker Jakob Ruckel opened a shop and a factory in Munich in 1839. Exports overseas began in 1890. The sixth the generation of Ruckels is due to inherit a family business with current annual sales of 20 million euros. The family philosophy is simple. Produce high quality, classy products. Their lines include gloves made of ostrich leather or eel skin. The leather has to be soft, thin and stretchable. The variety of designs we can offer is limited by certain technical considerations. Barring those, we can do just about anything. The future of gloves is bright. After all, being warm, expressing your unique individual style and maintaining your commitment to fashion has never been easier. The list of illustrious fashion houses is long. Chanel, Dior, Yves Saint Laurent and Louis Vuitton to name just a few. Well, technically they are all major competitors, but for a good cause they agreed to collaborate. For UNICEF, 100 of the world's top designers created unique dolls to be auctioned off. And the money will go to help children in Darfur and interest was high when the dolls were unveiled in Paris. The Petit Palais in central Paris is playing host to a different kind of fashion show, with some 100 dolls on display over the 25-meter-long catwalk. They're the signature creations of top designers, with apparel as varied as their creators. Whether big, small, oversized, extravagant or provocative, there's something for everyone. And in most cases, the designer behind the doll is unmistakable. While the Kenzo model is draped in a kimono, the Versace doll bears a striking resemblance to head designer Donatella Versace. Needless to say, Louis Vuitton's envoy has a handbag at her side. With most dolls, you can tell who made them. They're often reminiscent of the designer's most recent collection. You can immediately tell that the Kenzo doll was made by Kenzo. And the same is true with Christian Lacroix. Many are easy to identify, and that's good. French lingerie designer Chantal Thomas created this doll for a good cause. I decided to make a cubist doll, and I made it by putting together boxes in shapes I like. Then I painted them or decorated them with fabric in the label's style, using a lot of lace and raised patterns, and all of it in pink. When it comes to fashion, to each their own. And Parisian designer Jean-Charles de Castelbajac has come up with a modern doll artwork. But his colleague Lolita Lampica takes a more elegant approach. For this special occasion, I've created a stylish, sophisticated doll with a proper hairdo. She has braids and jewelry in her hair, and a draped dress of silk mousseline with a belt. Very elegant. For me, it's a very refined look. 2,000 people flock to the Petit Palais to see and compare these unusual designer creations. 
This one was made by German fashion designer Tilman Grave. He and his doll feel quite at home amongst creations by labels like Chanel, Dior, Yves Saint Laurent and Dolce & Gabbana. When you know that this and that fashion house are represented, you think, my doll should look good or at least representative. Basically, either you get involved and give it your all, so it turns out well, or you might as well forget it. Tilman Grave spent three days fashioning his doll out of crystal and aluminum. Now he hopes Kristallica will raise lots of money for charity. The designer dolls are to be auctioned off to the highest bidder on November 27th. We auction them off because they're real collector's items. The variety is extraordinary. You can recognize the designer's style and vision in his or her doll. And I'm sure one day we'll be seeing them in museums. But before these dolls wind up in museums, they'll hopefully raise lots of money for UNICEF. Well, speaking of museums, the man we're about to meet has established 13 of them all on his own steam, both here in Germany and as far afield as Denmark, Austria, France and Norway. German entrepreneur Reinhold Wirth, who made his fortune with nuts, bolts and screws, has now opened his newest museum in a former church dating back to the 12th century. St. John's Church in Schwäbisch Hall dates back to the 12th century. After major restoration work, it's now been reopened as a museum. The Johanniter Halle now houses the old master's collection. Patron of the arts Reinhold Wirth paid millions for what was originally the Fürstlich Fürstenberg collection of 14th and 15th century paintings to prevent them from being sold abroad. For the Swabian businessman, restoring and converting the old church was a labor of love. I'd say it's basically a feeling of harmony. I looked at this building, the way it looked when we acquired it. It was a sports hall and a rehearsal space for the Schwäbisch Hall Arts Festival. And it was in bad shape. Together with the state conservation authorities, we've invested a lot in the project and carried out a lot of archaeological work in the process. The 14th century Gothic roof framework has been exposed. It's the oldest of its kind in southern Germany. The recently reopened St. John's Church is full of surprises for Schwäbisch Hall's citizens. It's one of a kind, especially if you think about what this building has been through. And now look at how beautiful it is. It's just wonderful. I've been looking at St. John's for 20 years, and I'm all the more impressed seeing the woodwork for the first time. It's amazing to think that this was used as a party room and people used to put their cigarettes out on the floor. It's the perfect place for these wonderful pictures. And as a citizen of the city, I'm happy to see this place get back the flair it once had many hundreds of years ago. Reinhold Wirth's nuts and bolts business is an international market leader. The 73-year-old entrepreneur is also a passionate patron of the arts. Wherever his company has a branch, a museum appears too. Reinhold says that an art collection's association with the company is good publicity. He's founded 14 other museums, among them one in France and one in Spain. Art has influenced his life tremendously. My contact with art was personally enriching. My business is all about precision. I'm constantly responsible for 65,000 employees. Art has helped to balance that out. I had regular contact with the artists whom I visited in their studios. And that was a completely different world for me. Wirth has complimented his collection in Schwäbisch Hall with works such as the Madonna from Tiermann Riemenschneider's studio and paintings from the 15th century, such as Kanach the Elder's Jesus Blesses the Little Children. 
Zeiten, in der Zeit von In an age of the Internet and computers and rationality, I do think that people still like to look back 500 years. And through the paintings we've put on display here, they can get a sense of what life was like at that time. After viewing this impressive collection, visitors will come away with a greater appreciation for Germany's cultural heritage. A pinhole camera, also known as a camera obscura, is a precursor of the lens camera and pretty much how photography first got started. All you need to make one is a lightproof box with a hole in one side. And Berlin-based photographer Karin Stuke uses this primitive concept to capture an entire opera in a single image. Well, it sounds crazy, but the results are unique and we saw how it's done at the recent premiere of Peter Rusitschka's Holderlin. Karen Stuka's opera photographs depict strange spaces and transfigured settings. These dreamlike pictures were taken with a camera obscura, also known as a pinhole camera. Stuka had long wanted to capture an entire opera in one photo. She succeeded in creating this mystical picture. The several hour long production is now immortalized on a single negative in which the ghostly scenes overlap. The nice thing about it is it appears very ghostly, that it basically shows the soul of a production through the mood, the blurriness, through the coloration. Stuka is on her way to photograph another opera at Berlin Staatsoper on Unter den Linden. This time it's the world premiere production of Peter Ruschitzke's Hüldelin. She takes her camera obscura with her. It has no lenses, only a tiny hole. Because its aperture is so small, exposure times can be very long. The hard thing about a camera obscura is that it doesn't really have a viewfinder, so you can't see if you've got the whole stage in it. You just have to learn from experience and guess a little bit to set it up to capture everything. But it's fine now. Composer and director Peter Ruschitzka is also making his final preparations. Although he'll be concentrating solely on his music, he loves the idea that his production's magic moments will be photographed. When we begin a work, we composers always have an endpoint in sight. And when one photograph succeeds in capturing all that from the first impulse to the final moment to the imaginary endpoint, then it's something beyond compare. We composers can't produce what a talented photographer can. Begabter Fotograf leistet. The pinhole camera doesn't capture single moments, but rather the production as a whole. Two hours are reflected in a single image. Sometimes you have dreams or deja vus, where you have the feeling of seeing several things at once. That's very thrilling. I'm excited to see what will be visible on my photo, the photo of my production. Karen Stuka is excited too. She's had the negative developed and now wants to scan and analyze it. Every photograph is an experiment. There's always the danger that the stage will be too well lit and the photo will turn out all white. But the first impression is positive. The picture's a bit overexposed, but it's possible to correct that. I like the fact that it's so versatile, that not just one scene is dominant, but rather that at least two or three stage sets are recognizable. This statue once stood, but later was laid down. The singers and the chorus look like apparitions, and the colors have become mixed. Karen Stuka has a second passion, taking moving aerial photos of cities. She's visiting the rotating restaurant in Berlin's TV Tower, which makes one full turn every hour. It's a concept I've pursued in several photo series. I incorporate a period of time over which I have no influence all into one photo. She's done 360-degree photos of Berlin, Los Angeles, Oakland, Dusseldorf and Frankfurt. 
The pictures look similar, but each city has its own unique look. Now Karin Stuka just has to sit back and let the city colors and the camera do the work. After all, when it comes to camera obscura photography, patience is a virtue. And don't forget, if you'd like to see any of these reports again from our Highlights edition, all you have to do is go find them on YouTube. and You can see the website blended in on your screen. That brings us to the end of this edition of our Highlights. Until we meet again, take good care and auf Wiedersehen.